Hi, I'm Olivia. And I'm Amy. And this is a Girls in Marketing podcast. Every week, we release a new episode that you won't want to miss. Our guests are industry experts with amazing experiences, so you'll always come away with new nuggets of wisdom. From educational and inspiring episodes covering the latest in digital marketing, to casual and fun chats with the Girls in Marketing team, unpacking marketing myths and trends, we've got it all. Here at Girls in Marketing, we're all about empowering and supporting women to be the best marketers they can be through our online learning platform and community check out our resources and membership to get involved as we'd love to welcome you to our inner circle right let's dive into an episode together hey everyone amy here today we're celebrating the end of season four of the girls in marketing podcast with a wrapped episode i can't believe we've already reached the end of yet another wonderful season of the podcast We've had guests from incredible brands who shared their insights and expertise on a range of marketing topics. So if you haven't already, make sure to go back and dive into some of this season's episodes. We can't thank you enough for listening and engaging with the podcast. Every rating and listen really does help us more than you could imagine. A huge thank you for listening to our episodes this season. And even though the season's over, don't worry. You can stay up to date with podcast news by following our podcast LinkedIn page linked in the show notes. But for now, enjoy this exclusive wrapped episode. Olivia Hanlon, if someone had told you a few years ago that you would be the founder of a business with a huge online community of women like what Girls in Marketing has, what would you have said? If someone had told me that a few years ago, I honestly wouldn't have believed you I think it's crazy because I never really set out for girls in marketing to be what it is today Mm -hmm. so a few years ago it was just something that I wanted to do whilst I was working full-time it was kind of a bit of a side project that I was just a bit of a passion project if you will really enjoyed doing it but I would never anticipate I I never even anticipated to go on to hire people or have a team or for girls in marketing to be what it is. Definitely not. I think it was a really, it's always a a really strange one for me to think about it, which is why it's so odd that I'm sat here with you (laughs) and doing this because it's just, it's crazy. Yeah. So how did it actually start out? You know, obviously I know you said that you would have not believed it if someone would have told you that. What did it start out as and what was your initial intention for girls in marketing? Yeah. So let, let's take you back a little bit Ooh. to summer 2019. <laughs> um, I had finished university. I was working full time in an SEO and content role. And I really loved marketing, but I just didn't really want to kind of go down the path that I was going down. I love SEO and I love content, but I just felt like there was something missing for me. And I'm one of those people who just love to do something on the side, something a bit different, keep your brain active. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I thought, you know what, I'm going to try and make more friends in marketing because that was something else as well is I was very much in the position where I was in a in a team and I loved the people that I was working with but there wasn't really anyone who was a similar age to me who was a similar kind of vibe to me I had colleagues that were great but it wasn't anything that I wanted to kind of pursue it outside of work if you will so I wanted to find more friends who were marketers who had that same passion as me and so yeah I I decided to set up the website to set up the Instagram page Um, I'm very lucky that my partner is a was a web developer he's now a software engineer which Mm -hmm. is a different thing if you didn't know Um, (laughs) and he was a web developer so he helped me set up the website and everything Um, and yeah I just kind of decided right I'm going to do some kind of small events for people in in the local area so northwest Liverpool Manchester and then the dreaded kind of lockdown happened. Um, The looming lockdown was happening in kind of January, 2020. So it didn't go ahead. And I decided to take it online. Um, And the actual reason that Girls in Marketing got so big was because I was actually rejected for a job. So I went for a job at a nonprofit Mm. and the task in the interview phase, which I know a lot of people listening will have been asked to do task interview phase before. And the task was to create a full digital strategy 
that was completely organic because they were a non-profit. So they didn't, um, they, they didn't want to pay for ads and stuff like that. And that wasn't really my forte anyway. Mm-hmm. So created it all, absolutely loved creating it, presented it and I got rejected from the job and I was absolutely devastated. Genuinely was so sad. Again, I'm sure people will have been in that position before, yeah. um, you know, being rejected from a job that you really wanted. And I actually felt like I got it in the bag. You know, when you leave an interview and you think, yes, I've got yeah, it. Yeah, smashed it. And then email arrives, you've been unsuccessful. I cried, I was so devastated, but I use, ultimately I kind of use that strategy to leverage girls and marketing to grow its online presence, SEO, everything like that. Um, And yeah, now it is where it is, which is crazy. Um, And I carried on working full time for a while. And then I decided to quit my job, go freelance. Mm -hmm. So I was freelancing kind of three to four days a week doing girls and marketing one to two days a week and yeah it was just it was crazy and then now obviously full-time on girls in marketing got the team yourself in, included <laughs> which is it's a it's crazy to even think about but I absolutely have loved every second of it and yeah. girls in marketing wasn't what I thought it would be but it's so much more than I thought it would ever be Grace Andrews Grace Andrews so big question and, you know, feel free to break it down if you want. <laughs> but how how do you kind of approach social media strategy? Because I think so many people have the misconception of social media just being posted on Instagram <laughs> or posted on Facebook. My mom still thinks, shout out to my mom. <laughs> she still thinks it's, you know, posting on Facebook and, mm. oh, I love that Facebook post that you do. I'm like, didn't even do that, but okay. What, what, how do you approach social media strategy from, from your perspective? And your yeah, I mean, just on that, I regularly humble myself by asking my parents what I do. Like yeah. it's, it's always very refreshing to just, just get their new takes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> social media strategy, people overcomplicate it, right? So essentially there are three stages to a strategy. It's the, the research and the informing stage. You've then got the middle stage, which is the sharing, the creating, the actual content. And then you've got the reviewing stage that feeds back into the cyclical process. In kind of layman's terms, that's as simple as it needs to be. The missing piece that so many brands miss and so many businesses overlook is the is the two sides of it, right? As you said, everyone thinks it's the posting, it's the creating, it's the content, put it out into the ether, hope for the best. If you're not doing the informing stage and you're not doing the reviewing process at the end, it's all pointless. You're not going to grow. In fact, you're probably going to spiral downwards because the trends and the p- platform updates are happening so, so quickly that you don't stand a chance. So what I mean when I talk about this informed stage or this research stage, it's not, you know, looking at your competitors. What I mean at this stage is not your, not looking at your what. So when I talk about your what, you're a drinks brand, the what is the drink, you need to be looking at your why. So why have you created this brand? Why did you get out of bed in the morning? Why do you do it? So if we're talking about drinks brands, we look at like Red Bull, their, what is their, their energy drink, right? Their, their cans, we all know what they look like, they're everywhere. Their why is they want to give you energy. That's their whole why, uh, Red Bull gives you wings. So you look on their social media, you look on their marketing, you're not going to see cans of Red Bull. You're going to see stories about real humans who are on all these different challenges, trying to use different forms of energy to succeed in all different areas of life. Because people buy from stories, people buy from feeling, they don't buy things. So when you're doing that informing stage, it's not about looking at what drinks brands competitors are doing. Like that's actually really unhelpful. What you need to do is go back to your why, think about why you are doing this, because that That feeling is what's going to connect with your audience. It's what's going to build the loyalty. It's what's going to build the trust. And it's what's going to turn your your audience into a community that's going to turn into a customer who will eventually buy your what. Flo, senior PR strategist at Lush. I think one thing for the majority of our listeners um, that they will know Um, about Lush in terms of their marketing is the fact that Lush obviously kind of came off social media, um, which at the time was, you know, a really big move and I guess still is. It's a big thing to do, isn't it, for such a huge brand to kind of say we're going to, you know, come off social media and, you know, we're going to come away from it and and that sort of thing. Um, Obviously, I know that you were at Lush. Were you at Lush at the time when it actually happened? Yeah. Yeah. And what was the (laughs) what was the sort of kind of... um, I guess the, the reason and behind that, what was Lush aiming to do with coming off social media? What was the message? Yeah, I was actually at Lush both times. So oh, okay. <laughs> we uh, left a couple of platforms mm-hmm. actually pre-pandemic. Right, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
because the brand team and the directors and everyone, they were just like monitoring social media and there were always like concerns on like well-being. Mm. And the question really is social media, social media, is it more media or is it really still social? Yeah, yeah. And I think many people just started thinking about that. Um, but then the pandemic happened and obviously it was such a shock for everybody. Mm -hmm. And um, we just had to find ways again to talk to our customers and yeah. that so we were again like on socials for a while mm -hmm. but then um when the whistleblower files came out uh, yeah. of Francis Hogan um in 2021 mm -hmm. um it was a pretty like quick reaction and then we were just like okay we need to leave the meta platforms and TikTok and um so we're still on a couple of platforms actually so yeah. we're still on like LinkedIn mm -hmm. and YouTube and Twitter which we're currently like looking at <laughs> yeah I think story. everybody's <laughs> sort of not really sure whether that would fit at the moment are they I know but yeah we're um we switched off basically and we yeah. just like changed the way we talk to customers yeah instead of leaving socials yeah definitely and I think yeah obviously you've not completely gone you know silent radio silent across the board on social media but I think it was those bigger platforms wasn't it it was like the meta ones and TikTok yeah. and stuff like that that I guess maybe people would have um, um, more commonly associated with seeing the brand and stuff. So obviously it is a big move. How was that both times, I guess, communicated internally, both to kind of the, the people working in the social teams and in marketing and kind of the rest of, of the organisation at Lush? What, how was that message communicated? What did that look like? I think, yeah, I, th I think it's mixed, obviously, mm -hmm. um, because some people were immediately, like, supportive. And I think Lush is a company um, that's definitely a campaigning company. Mm -hmm. So we do mm -hmm. lots of, mm -hmm. like, campaigns that you can see online or on, in the shop windows or something, or you can take part in generally, um, also very often together with grassroots and stuff. Yeah. But I think it was, for some people, it was definitely a shock. And for me as well, I have to say, my first thought was, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I always knew, okay, shocking things happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. But whilst reflecting and just like, it, obviously it was communicated, we will find where the community sit. We will find new, exciting ways to reach mm -hmm. our customers and um, to be part of communities. And we shouldn't really control the narrative as mm -hmm. a brand of like mm -hmm. a conversation mm -hmm. within a community. And when you start thinking about it, it's true. Why Why would you control the entire narrative? Hannah Anderson, to be honest, it's, it's something that comes up quite a lot with people in our community that kind of either having a career path in mind, going to university and studying a particular thing and then falling into marketing after uni or just you know finding an interest in some area of marketing and going into it or starting a career in something and actually then deciding this isn't for me and then career changing into marketing and you know I think it happens quite a lot those untraditional routes into it and I think you have just kind of got to give yourself to it and just see what happens with it and I think looking too far ahead with anything for me is always a bit it's a bit pointless and you've just got to kind of see where it goes 100%. but I think it's interesting obviously that you're interest and love for social media then did evolve into a career how was that did you find that your your love for social media I mean I imagine it really did grow because obviously you're still doing it now so you know I, I think I know the answer to that but how did it sort of change you know your relationship with social media going from something that you did as like a personal thing that was just like a hobby and something that you found really fun to then obviously working in it like how did you find yeah. that change in working in social yeah. I still I still do like love it I'm still very fascinated with it mm. to this day I think something that I had to do was kind of set boundaries for myself because I think for anyone who works in social mm. um if your day-to-day -day job is social and then you go home and you relax by scrolling through Twitter or scrolling through TikTok mm. that's like unhealthy and, and especially in the early days like there was no so there was no switching off so it kind of like kind of like dulled my relationship with it a little bit and I have a very like in interesting like path with social I kind of don't really touch it on a personal oh, really? sense now yeah, yeah that's interesting and I didn't like I, I, I did a little bit but I don't like you know I don't I'm not trying to like build a you know my personal Instagram for example mm -hmm. um because I did that once and it and it just it wasn't good for me on my mental health. Yeah. But I, I definitely like I had to I had to set boundaries and had to say like, you know, don't, you know, it's it's tricky tricky to describe. Like, say for example, I can't put value on myself if a page does well or it doesn't do well because yeah. sometimes like 
the platforms, the algorithms will will say, no, you, that's not going to work anymore. And yeah. if you like attach your personal value to how many followers you can build or how well a page can do or whatever it is, yeah. then that's quite damaging. Mm-hmm. So I still have a love for social and I still have a, a fascination about it and I find it very um, simple to understand that makes sense mm. like I can yeah. like read it well and like the analytics and all that jazz yeah but um I definitely have to kind of separate myself from it a lot more than I did in those early days Isabel Cowell talking about LinkedIn I think it's your jam isn't it yes. LinkedIn is definitely your jam <laughs> personal branding is your jam so obviously you work at Kruger which is mm-hmm. a personal branding agency and um, but you also do have a large personal brand following Mm -hmm. yourself tell me a little bit about how you actually how that came about what happened because obviously you've done these internships you kind of in the industry now what kind of happened then after that yeah so originally I just got into social media marketing I didn't know the phrase personal branding existed I kind of I started building up my LinkedIn so I'd got done the banner photo and like made sure my profile picture looked good or whatever beforehand but I'd never kind of heard of personal branding or seen anyone posting more like personal stuff for me LinkedIn was like corporate it was very much black and white you post your promotions you post I don't know like I don't know if you've graduated university that's what I thought it was um and then my boss actually met well, my now boss messaged me on New Year's Eve. So this is when I was still working at a social media agency, basically saying, hi, I found you on LinkedIn. Bear in mind, I had like 600 followers at this point um, who weren't even really followers. They were like connections. They mm-hmm. weren't like people who followed me for content. And he said, do you want to apply for this personal brand management job? And I said, oh my gosh, yes, of course. Sounds amazing. When I went and Googled, what is personal branding? What is personal brand management? Um, and yeah, and that's kind of how I started was out of necessity, if I'm being honest. Like, it seemed like a really cool company. I really wanted to get involved. And I was like, I need to figure out how to do this. I have three weeks mm-hmm. between now and the start day of this job. I need to start posting or else I'm just going to show up on day one and know nothing. And I think that's kind of a really important thing to say as well like I didn't go into it with I want 50,000 followers and I want to be on podcasts and I want to do this and the other I went into it because I was like I want to learn how to do this and I think that's a really really important thing I think as soon as you go in and you think I want to go viral I'm going to copy what other people are doing purely so that I can get thousands of views or whatever straight away your content is just not gonna attract the right people because you're not going at it from a right point of view. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I've only been doing it for about 10 months now, um, which is kind of crazy. But yeah, it's just one of those things where you just got to keep going at it. So yeah, it's cool. What about the first post then? So I know you kind of did it out yeah. of necessity, but I get so many people saying to me, okay, I understand what I've got to do. Mm -hmm. I know how I can build my personal brand. I understand my values and everything I want to bring to the table. How do I actually just do it? (laughs) Do it. Because I think it's so difficult. And genuinely for for me, when I first started, I was very much, you know, on LinkedIn anyway, as an Mm -hmm. employee, kind of not really doing anything to do with personal brands. And then I was like, right, I'm just going to kind of post. And because of the type of person I am, I wasn't too bothered about posting. And, Mm -hmm. you know, the first few only got, you know, two or three likes. But it didn't bother me because I was posting it because I wanted to. But I think a big issue that a lot of people face is kind of imposter syndrome, but mm-hmm. also just the aspect of should like are people am I allowed? See this? <laughs> yeah. What what happens? Like what's yeah. the kind of what's the deal? So for you, how did you overcome that? And how did you actually post? And what advice would you give to people that are looking to do that? Yeah, I think for starters, you don't have to do your first post where it's super personal and groundbreaking or no post you ever do have to do that. I did actually a LinkedIn, um, an Instagram post about this through the week. And it was, my first post was five facts about me. Mm-hmm. My first post that went like kind of viral, like I got like 900 reactions, was a marketing campaign. It was like I don't know, a screenshot of a McDonald's marketing campaign with a very short caption. And that was like my seventh post. And I think it's really important. Just like break into it. So you don't feel like you've got to post every day. Don't feel like you've got to, Go and super personal. Post about your industry. What are you interested in? Post about, I know a lot of people watching this are going to want to break into marketing or are in marketing. So post about a campaign that you really love or some tips. For example, what are your SEO tips or things like that? I think that really helps people to kind of break into it slowly because you're not saying anything controversial. You're not kind of opening yourself up to the world. You're just giving facts, which I think is quite useful. I think also, like I said, off the back of that, nothing has to be 
groundbreaking either. I can guarantee almost every single thing people post on LinkedIn is on Google somewhere. Mm -hmm. I think my first like viral, viral post was about me being in my childhood bedroom. And I was like, wow, this is really ugly. Like I wanted to take a photo and I was like, wow, like this, it did not look like this. Like Mm -hmm. there was no lighting, no nothing. And people related to that. And I think that's just a really important place to start. Like you don't have to be the world expert to post. You don't have to break every rule ever. You just have to talk about what you want to talk about. Thanks so much for joining us for another episode of the Girls in Marketing podcast. We love hearing from you. So if you enjoyed this episode, leave us a review to let us know your thoughts and make sure you hit the subscribe or follow button to be the first to hear when our new episodes release. Don't forget, if you want to get involved with Girls in Marketing, check out our membership to join our incredible community of marketers. Think marketing resources, courses, webinars, and more. Find out more on our website or drop us a message on any of our social channels at Girls in Marketing.